Yeah, so what's on agenda today, right? We'll see what are the practices uh, you need to enable to crack a data science interview, right? What kinds of questions are as in a data science interview? Expectations, right? We'll do some polls, some resume mistakes that you might be doing right away, which doesn't even lead you to an interview, right? A lot of resume parsing systems are very uh, specifically built that actually sees whether your resume addresses a few points or not, right? And whether the templates are solid or not, whether the templates are software friendly or not, if any one of these three points is missing, your res resume is already thrown in the dustbin and it never reaches the manager's desk, right? At the last, we'll also see what is the importance of JD. I've kept this as a last topic because this, this is the least, least researched or spoken about topic, right? Which plays a very important role, right? So this is uh, the last topic and then we'll be open for all the questions, any kinds of questions that you guys are having right cool let's just jump into it what are the most commonly asked questions in data science interviews so i'll just take a quick uh, poll over chat box you can just tell me yes or no right uh, have you taken or have you given any data science interviews not taken have you given any data science interview quick 30 seconds just type yes or no it could be online or face to face not coding around cool cool okay okay so it'll be much easier for me to actually explain it so that all the misconceptions are already cleared, right? So what do you expect in a data science interview, right? What are the most common questions? Uh, take a nice Shantanu, yeah. Uh, what, what kind of questions are based in a data science interview, right? So whenever an interviewer comes uh, to an interview, he is well prepared, right? First, he has uh, what kinds of questions he needs to ask is very clear in his mind. What questions again in these topics is very clear what he needs to ask. Right. And then again, there are a few company related questions that they're working on, a company related projects that they're working on that they might do pick your brain and see how you perform on them. Right. We'll start with uh, the basics here, right? Because no ML interview happens without talking about data. Right. If you talk about ML, the first thing you talk about is data. Right. So the immediate thing after seeing your resume, uh, an interviewer would ask you to introduce yourself probably and then tell, okay. Okay, tell me more about this particular project that you have worked on, right? And the first thing that he will see is everything about the data set, right? Tell me a little bit about the number of records present in your data set, what features were present, what classes were present, if it's a classification problem, if it's a clustering problem, what clusters were present eventually, right? He'll try to get an understanding whether you have a good memory as well as you are well aware of these minor things around data, and which is very important. Right. It's not just the algorithm that you build, not just the project that you work on, knowing everything about the data set, familiarizing yourself with the data set is a very, very, very important part, right? Because this will set the path for the model that you develop. This will set the path for what will be your eventual accuracy, right? Unless you're not familiar with the data, you cannot build a great model, right? All kinds of metadata about this data, right? So it could be, uh, are there any gaps in the data? Are there any issues with the data? Where do you download the data from? Is the data organic or synthetic, right? What are the sources of data, right? Do they have, first of all, do you have multiple sources of obtaining this data set? Or did you just download it from Kegel or was it present publicly in some data set on some website, right? So uh, if it is organic or if it is synthetic, if it's hybrid, it's a mix of organic or synthetic, they try to understand your approach and how you obtain the data, right? Because going into companies, you do not find data readily available. Right. Either you have to get the data from uh, the people who are using your app, right? You do all kinds of uh, analytics over that to get the data, right? You capture all kinds of user behaviors, user journeys, user responses to get all kinds of data, and then you build models around it, right? So let's say, for example, if I'm building a search engine uh, for an app, then I will store all kinds of queries which are searched by users, right? And then whatever results I display, I will store which result the user clicked in the top five results, let's say, for example. So sometimes I have to collect the data. Sometimes I have to generate the data, right? When I collect the data, it's organic. When I generate it, it is called synthetic, right? Again, this is a very deep module in itself where you can generate data either using, if it's an IoT project, for example, you can have sensors installed at locations, at fields. And if it is uh, probably a, a software kind of a problem that you're working on, then you can generate the synthetic data with your, from your original data. People do that a lot. It depends, totally depends on the problem you're solving. Now with the amount of data you have, 
right? How do you evaluate the quality of your data? How do you evaluate the quality of your features, right? That's something they ask. Is the, is the data good? Is the data bad? Is the data sufficient? That is the next kind of question, right? Let's say you're solving a 10 class problem, a 10 class classification problem, right? And suddenly somebody says, and, and let's say you have just 10,000 records and the immediate question the interviewer will ask is, will you, do you think you have enough data to solve this problem? Right. Will this model generalize over new data that it has not seen mm. when I put it in the field, actually? Right. So that's something that you need to answer for yourself right? before itself. If it was not enough, did you generate more data or did you collect more data? Right. These are called data augmentation techniques. Right. You augment your data set with newer data, with more data. Right. With uh, we generally don't duplicate the data because it degrades the performance, but we try to get variations of these duplicates. Right from this data. Now that you have data, now that you have obtained data, what are the data pre-processing techniques you have applied, right? Because you don't just apply model on an existing data set, right? You have to clean it. You have to reconfigure it. You have to update it. Basically, you're doing all kinds of mathematical operations on this data at a feature level to actually clean this data before you can apply any modeling technique on it, right? So the immediate question is, first of all, you have to understand what kind of features are present in the data set. Right. This is, a, this is again a very possible question. Did you have only numerical attributes? Did you have categorical attributes? Did you have uh, floating point attributes? Did you have uh, multi-level attributes? Right. All kinds of features are present. Did you have uh, geographical attributes, which are latitude, long, longitude positionals? Right. You can have all kinds of features present in the data set, uh, depending on the problem that you're working. Right. So how did you clean it up? If there were any imputations that you did, let's say there were some gaps in some rows, some of the data was not available for a particular row. Right. So how did you address those problems? Did you do some normalizations? Let's say uh, we're talking about height, right? And height in centimeters, let's say could be up to 200 centimeters, right? And how do you normalize this data so that it goes between zero and one? Right. Did you identify any outliers? Outliers meaning if now let's say somebody writes a height of 1000 centimeters, right? Which is impossible for a human being, right? So it's an outlier. Did you identify these outliers? Did you do any kinds of data visualization techniques to identify these outliers, right? How did you pre-process these outliers? How did you correct these outliers? Again, a very deep, deep, deep problem that, uh, that is accompanied with any kind of data set we work with. They're always outliers because data is never clean, right? That's one of the things data scientists are always worried about. Did you find any correlations in the data? Did you find if one feature is related to another feature, right? Let's say height could be related to age, right? And uh, let's say metabolism could be related to uh, your physical activity, right? So did you find any kinds of such correlations in your data? And did you try to reduce your features by the correlation uh, that you have observed between these features, right? When you have correlation between two features, it means the features are related, they're connected, right? They're dependent on each other. So you can reduce such features. For example, uh, the run rate of a team in cricket is dependent on the individual strike rate of the players, right? So there is a correlation between a batsman strike rate and the team's run rate, right? Right, now, before we jump into the next topic, uh, do you guys have any questions till this point? The quest these are all questions around data, what an interviewer would expect you to know beforehand for every project that you have worked on, right? And a question could come from either of these three verticals, right? It could be statistics around data, it could be augmenting the data, or it could be cleaning up the data. We still haven't even touched the questions on modeling yet. Any any questions or clarifications at this point? Or probably Shantanam, because you've taken an interview, probably you would have asked one of these questions among these three slides, right? At some point or the other for interviewees. Synthetic focus of organic, organic data differences. Okay, cool. Let me give you an example to explain it better, right? So, what I do is, let's say the problem I want to solve is very simple, okay? Given a medical record, right? I want to understand when did a particular person, I've actually worked on this problem, so I'm taking the same one. When did this particular person start smoking, right? Assume that he's a smoker that is given to you, right? So I just want to understand given the whole medical history, when did this person start smoking, right? Now, or let's take a simpler problem on in the same domain. Like given a medical record, I need to understand whether this person has ever smoked a cigarette or not. And that's all. Now, given that the variation of patients who have cancer, right? Now they could be equally divided between children, men, and women, 
for example, right? And mostly smokers are men. That's what we have observed logically, right? Majority smokers are men. Now in this data set, you will find a lot of records on people who have not smoked, right? Versus less number of records on people who have actually smoked, right? So the amount of data you have for actual smokers is less compared to the amount of data you have to non-smokers. Now, this is organic data, which you have got from these actual patients, actual medical records, right? What a synthetic data is when you try to balance the number of records for even smokers, when you try to increase by generating more records for these organic smokers in your data set to increase the size of your data set so that your model can perform without bias, right? If on the original data, if on the organic data, I applied my model, right? It would always lean more towards non-smokers because for every smoker, I have a large number of non-smokers in my data set, right? Assume that ratio is one is to five. Right. So there is a 80% bias or a one is to four bias to non-smokers over smokers to balance this bias. Of course, there are modeling techniques, but we can also augment this data by generating more synthetic data by removing the bias in the beginning itself, by reducing the bias in the beginning itself. So for doing this, we add more data points to these smokers by generating synthetic data. By observing these smoker records, we add more records to the smoking class. Right? So that the bias, so that equal number of records or almost equal number of records are present between smokers and non-smokers. So that is synthetic data, right? There are various ways, various algorithms to generate synthetic data. Uh, Srikanth has a question, which outlier method is used more to solve outlier issues, right? So there is no uh, one shoe fits all, right, Srikanth, in data science, right? If I have a textual problem, my outliers will be very different. If my data is textual, my outliers are very different, right? Probably my outlier for a text data is data in a different language altogether, right? If 99% of users are using English in my search queries, and if 1% of the users are using, for example, French, right? Or typing French, right? Then that's an outlier for me. And that's a textual problem. So the outlying techniques to detect this outliers will be very different compared to, let's say, an image data, right? Let's say I get images from uh, a sensor, right? That records at a traffic signal that records people who have crossed these lines, right? And suddenly, mm -hmm. let's say a cow comes in, Right? So that's an outlier for an image data. Detecting these outliers is very much different. You cannot put a challenge on a cow, right? So detecting this outlier for an image data is very different compared to detecting uh, outliers in textual data, right? Again, for numerical data, you have to plot graphs that will give you better understanding to understand the, to identify these outliers, right? Which outlier techniques are used for numerical data. So there are a few statistical techniques that you can use, right? You can, uh, for numerical data, you let's say for a feature, you can create or you can uh, calculate their variance and mean, right? And then see between this variance, what all points are there and outside this variance, what points fall, right? And probably you can visualize these points at how far they are from the variance. So variance for a feature will record how varied the data is. And if a point is more varied than the actual variance, right? Then you can consider it to be outlier post-examination, right? So there are statistical methods like this called mean variance that help you understand the outliers. There are visualization methods also that help very much, right? When you box plots these uh, curves, when you box, box plots these features, they will also help you to understand how numerical data for a feature is behaving, right? Again, you have outliers at embeddings also. Cool. Thank you, great questions guys, by the way. Keep the questions flowing guys. They could be technical or they could be uh, interview related as well. Any other questions before I jump into uh, the next slide? Could you please uh, full, full form that IQR interquartile range? So again, that's a statistical measure that we're talking about, right? So this is basically for a numerical attribute when you want to observe a variance in particular ranges, right? That's called quartile ranges, right? You apply a technique depending on the feature, depending on the data set that you have, right? There is no such thing that, okay, you can apply this technique to all the data sets, right? You have to, that's what we're trying to do here. We try to understand the data and then determine methods which which will help us identify these problems in our data, right? Cool. Move on to the next thing, next topic, right? So for any, let's say I, in my resume, I have five projects, right? Now we are moving from data to actual modeling questions, right? Let's say we have five projects in my resume and one of the projects is most interesting for an interviewer. He'll pick that project, right? So whatever algorithms you have written in that project, it is a given, 
right? That you have to understand the theory, math, and implementation end to end for that algorithm, right? You cannot hide behind the excuse saying, okay, this project I worked two years ago, I don't remember the theory or math behind it, right? That wouldn't give a very positive impression, right? Because people, when they expect that you have worked on a project, you have worked on it in depth, right? You have done something more than copy pasting code from probably Stack Overflow or some other website, right? You have dug deep in understanding data, then you have dug deeper into understanding the model, why you applied this model, why this model worked better than other models, right? Why this algorithm worked better? Why did it give a higher accuracy? Right. And all those will make sense. You'll be able to justify all these only when you understand these individual algorithms, right? In your project, you might only write the algorithm that worked for you, right? Let's say for classification, decision trees worked for me or XGBoost worked for me, right? But I would have tried four or five other algorithms that did not work for me, right? Let's say I tried SVM, but it did not work. And I might not mention that in my resume, right? But at least for XGBoost that worked for me, the interviewer would expect me to understand all these three parts equally good, right? You don't have to read the research papers on them, but they would expect you to understand them inside out, right? So generally, why, that's why what they do is either they do this when you're explaining a particular project or what they do is, this is my style as well. I've seen it done by really great interviews is they actually ask you to pick a topic something like you can pick classification, regression, or clustering. Let's say I'm talking about machine learning. And for the topic that you have chosen, let's say I choose classification, they'll ask you to pick an algorithm that you understand most, right? That you're very comfortable with, that you have used in your projects and assignments. And let's say I say random forest in classification, right? And then they will dig deep inside out, right? If I say random forest, sorry, if I say random forest, they will start talking about the entropy, information gain, build on top of it, how attributes are created, how attributes are dispersed at each node and how random forest is created eventually, right? From individual decision trees. So this is how a flow of, a different flow of an interview goes, either an algorithm is picked directly from your resume on a project that you have worked on, or it is picked step by step. It's just an interviewer style, right? But if you see the eventual understanding or the eventual goal is, to see whatever you have worked on, whether you are thorough in it or not, right? From these three perspectives, theory, math, and implementation. There is no concept in machine learning that does not have math, right? If you feel that you have not learned math or not seen any equation for any topic, you might want to revisit that topic, right? And I make my candidates write math equations on paper and show it to me on video. Right. I, I make them write loss functions. I make them write derivations. Most people are very fond about when they write deep learning in their resumes, interviewers are very fond about asking uh, to code up backprop or at least write down the math for backpropagation. Right? Because you guys are still in your second years and uh, third years, as I saw, uh, deep learning is something that would be your next skill set. Right? Just uh, a tip there. So this is how interviewers have two flavors of actually testing your algorithmic skills, right? And then they will relate this back to the projects that you have worked on. How did your implementation for a particular project change the algorithm? Okay, uh, now let's jump into uh, another very important thing that we have in our hand. This is something we control, right? As candidates, what are the mistakes we make in resume, right? This is something that uh, applies to almost every domain, but I reiterate the first point is do not exceed more than one page of a resume. When an interviewer prints out a resume, he wants it everything to be visible in front of his eyes, right? It takes, it's said that on average, it takes five seconds for an interviewer to move a candidate, whether, whether to interview a candidate or not after seeing his resume, right? So everything you need to communicate needs to be in one page. Right? Avoid tables, avoid graphics, avoid pie charts, avoid those line charts saying that I'm four out of five in Python, I'm eight out of 10 in machine learning. Those are just space eaters, right? Keep the template simple, keep the information straightforward, right? Express on your projects more clearly, right? With respect to English, with respect to grammar, with respect to fonts, right? You can use them very well to express different parts. Abhinav has a suggestion, uh, if we could also provide some tips on fresher resumes. Yes, absolutely Abhinav. Right, we will try. So these uh, common resume mistakes flow across year types, right? And uh, they should be applicable to freshers as well as very industry experienced candidates as well. Yeah, I'll try to pick up from po some points for freshers as well. Yeah. 
introduction matters the first line that you write right so this is your this now the ball is in your court right it's an open field you are free to fill it the way you want look at how great people fill it look at how great people describe themselves many people post their resumes online over linkedin as well right if you follow a few people try to get their resumes and see how they describe themselves right? this description matters when you are interviewing for higher positions probably not for freshers for one reason is for senior positions and for leadership positions interviewer would want to see your interest and your experience in leading teams in mentoring people in guiding people right the breadth of your skills not just data science but also other skills tech and managerial skills that complement your total skill set right because you you are being hired as a model as a role model to lead a team right so if you just go at data science and if you're bad at managing people that might not be a very positive sign for the interviewer right so in the introduction is what you can address or you can take the opportunity to address these questions for an interviewer if you're a fresher you can talk a lot about your passion and enthusiasm in data science right so that will be the opening statement that i would look for as freshers yes ganesh has a has a question how to join a data scientist role and how to join startups to high paying companies right we are going to dig deeper into it now so let's understand uh, how a great resume is built that we are prerequisite to the answer of your question yeah cool. now skill set listing skill set is a mandatory part of every resume i have seen cluttered resume where people write sql python everything mixed together flask and they then then they suddenly write decision trees and they come back and write mongodb elastic search and all right that that's that's not clear right the that does not give a clarity on your end right list skills in categories okay these are the databases i know these are the programming languages i have worked on right in these categories also you should write things you are most comfortable with first right so if i'm most comfortable with python i'll put it first and then c and then c++ then bash right so even when a interview wants to ask questions he will follow the same order right because he will respect what you have expressed how comfortable you are with each such skill and right when he wants to test it he will test you his expectations from python will be a lot compared to c right so even if you don't answer a question on c as well it should still be fine right so clarity is very important listing down skills in categories is very important right again this is your way of holding the direction of the questions right if i write sql first it is psychological that the interviewer will ask a question on sql first right even though they have been working on mongodb right assume a company that you are applying to works on mongodb but that's your secondary skill set in database right it's still fine right because if you have learned sql and if you know it well they would be happy to ask you a question on mongodb but even if you couldn't answer their hopes are still up because you know how a database works it's just that you have worked on sql and not mongo that's all so that's the thought process that goes on in an interviewer's mind right again listing your skills is a way of holding the direction of the questions in your hand right and again it is implicitly implied that you are more familiar with sql compared to mongodb yeah so immediately after skills the biggest part of your resume is how what you write about your projects how you write these projects and how you take this along right so one of the things <clears throat> that <clears throat> you can do here is you can order the projects on various ways yeah so as i was saying right so now we have to list down the projects and there are multiple ways multiple perspectives to look at this right i can either write projects based on the level of comfort i have solved them right probably i'm most familiar with this project so i'll place it first right that's one thought process the other thought process is the amount of difficult projects that i have solved first i would want to keep them first right the third way of doing it which i prefer the most is order your projects with respect to the company that you are applying to right if i have worked in edtech if i have worked in healthcare let's say i have done five projects across these two domains right core data science projects and if a company that i am applying to is in healthcare again i would want to put healthcare projects first and then edtech projects right so you have to be a little smart about it right because you want to grab the attention of the interviewer you want to grab the attention of the hr who's reading your resume right you want to get your first step into an interview right if your resume gets filtered out just by the way it is designed you are at a huge loss you don't even get to uh, prove yourself in an interview right so either you can do it with respect to uh, your interests 
right you can either do it with respect to the difficulty level or the business impact that your projects build right or you can also do it with respect to the domain or with respect to the company that you are applying to right the third one i'd prefer the most because it is most logical and it definitely grabs attention right but again it is you you're free one once you reach a very higher level you might want to do it in a different way basically you might want to put the projects which have the most business impact right if you're dealing for let's say a higher data science senior data science position or a data science lead position right then your individual projects don't matter the whole business impact that you have brought in the amount of uh, honors you have received right the number of compliments or the com- number of projects you have drawn to production those make sense right again it's a trade off right so there is no correct answer no one answer for it right you have to understand at which point of a career you are and what company you are applying to right and there's no wrong way also if you choose to do it with respect to business impact over the company that you are applying to there's nothing wrong there right interviewers will go through the whole resume and they will pick the relevant parts yeah now about each individual project right is make sure that you write clear english crisp and without errors be it english errors or grammatical errors or punctuation errors right you cannot have those rudimentary mistakes in your resume they are thrown out by the software itself right so there are software who process templates there are software run on resumes who process this basic english stuff when they ocr your resume when they read your resume right and if these minor things are not in place they might they might with a very high possibility probability throw your resume out and it doesn't even reach the hr right? the first line or the title of the project that you have worked on should be a problem that you have solved not the project that it is right for example if my project says uh, build a classifier to classify whether a patient smokes or does not smoke whether a patient is a smoker or a non smoker right that's the ml title that i would give to the project right but that's not the problem that i'm solving what is the problem that i'm solving the problem that i'm solving this is how i would express it is identify whether a patient is a smoker or non smoker right and retrieve relevant in, in information about him right something like this probably a little more uh, crispier or shorter right you don't want to mix tech with the problem people first want to interviewers first want to understand the problem that you have worked on and then you have two or three lines to express all kinds of tech you have used and models you have built to solve that problem right make sure you address why you for whom you made this project basically who are the stakeholders are doctors going to use the result of your output of your project are internal teams going to use it is the sales team going to use it is are the ceos going to use it of that companies who use your app who is going to use it right who is going to benefit from it what is the business impact that this project has brought to your company did it increase sales did it reduce the time customer looks to find the relevant information right did it reduce the time it takes to process a patient everything matters time matters money matters the percentage of users matters right now you can also list tech ac- accuracy metrics like precision recall f1 score f1 micro macro scores so many scores you can just blue score list everything that applies to your project right numbers is something people really like to see in your project right if you just implemented it, it is just as good as just doing something and leaving without evaluating it you don't stand a chance that you have done it well right yeah don't list the same projects that somebody from your batch has built right if a interviewer receives two resumes who have done the same projects they might as well throw away both the resumes right try to be different try to be unique here pick and build something that interests you rather than using the same old data sets from wikipedia building the same old same old hand gesture recognition or that iris data set and and i can list like 10 of those projects right that's almost present across resumes those don't really interest me what i generally do is i filter out those candidates who have worked on very generic projects because they have not seen the real data science world they have not attempted a real data science problem right if you're fresher so i can understand that you might not have company projects to already work on right but that's still not limitation to work on exciting projects you can always pick them from kegel 
Kegel hosted company projects, right? Companies host a lot of projects on their Kegel that problems are on Kegel, Kegel that they want to be solved. You can always pick them, attempt them and put them on your project rather than putting that digit recognition or dog cat classifier that nobody is going to use ever in life. As you're working on projects, try to build a portfolio for yourself, right? So when, when an interviewer sees your resume, he tries to see, he tries to connect your projects, right? So he tries to gauge your interest, what you're trying to build, what kind of a data scientist do you want to be? Do you want to be, if you have worked on three healthcare projects, it'll give him an idea. Okay, this guy has done a lot of work on healthcare. So if my company is in healthcare, for example, he's a very suitable candidate because he has built a portfolio of those projects. That's one way to look at it. The other way is if you want to work across industries, let's say finance, medical, and then ed tech, and then manufacturing, and mechanical, etc. right? Then, or uh, legal, you can apply AI everywhere. Right, then you can build a portfolio of these projects in breadthwise manner, but make sure that there is some connect between them. Right, try to express a connect between them. So the overall resume, the overall projects should build a portfolio out of yourself. Right, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, and don't mention these trivial assignments that you have solved uh, of doing CRUD operations on a data set or storing the data set in a database and retrieving the database and all that. That's assignment level stuff. Yeah, that's not project level stuff. Nobody uh, is given the cutthroat competition. Nobody is interested to see that level of work anymore. Yeah, I'm done with the resume section. Before I jump into uh, the JD part, I want to answer any questions you guys have. Do the certifications add to a resume? Very great question. Thanks, Kagana. I uh, couldn't address the certification part, right? Certifications do add value, right? I will tell you that. Right. But they will only add a minimum support to your resume. They will not be the reason that you are getting interviewed. Right. Because these common certifications like Coursera, they, and the sad part with them is because the solutions are available online, they don't really hold that much importance. Right. It's only the certifications that teach you live, that give you assignments live that you solve whose assignments or projects are different than what you do with Coursera, for example, who has the same project for the whole one and a half lakh kids who have learned from them. That doesn't really add weightage, right? Interviewers want to see you. Okay, you have learned from a trusted authority. You have learned from a trusted mentor. You have learned it well, and that is reflected by the projects that you have done, right? So your projects and your certifications are always connected, right? Certifications do add a lot of value right especially going higher in the hierarchy they add a lot of support right uh, yeah you have to have to do it well from a trusted party and make sure that reflects in your work through your projects right governor shrikant has a question should we have to put our schooling and intercourse no not really shrikant as you go higher in your uh, career these things are of lesser importance you can, but uh, I don't think people interviewers see after BTEC, but before BTEC, whatever you have done, it hardly matters. But any number of experiences that you have had previously, they all matter, assuming they're related to data science. Okay, so again, a quick yes or no question. Tell me if you have ever read a job description end to end, every word. Okay, Abhinav says no, Shantanu says yes, partially, so it's a no, Shrikant. Right, Abhinav, no, waiting for more responses. Thanks everyone for your honesty. But yeah, see, when I see, when I pick the majority, the answer is almost a no, right? We do not read JDs. We do not find them interesting, right? That's why we do not read them. And if it was put to us in a graphical way, in an infographic way, in a nice way, in a templated way, they would have been very uh, nice to read, right? But that's a limitation of the platform that they post the job on. So that cannot really be a problem with the company. It's a problem with the platform because LinkedIn offers a very textual way of putting all the job description. So uh, a company that posts its job cannot do much about it, but we need to do what we need to do to crack a job, right? There is no debate over the point that you have to read the JD entirely. If you're applying to hundred jobs, you have to read the JD of all the hundred jobs. There is no second point of discussion around it, right? A JD is meant for you to understand what your what the role expects from you and also meant for you to understand 
what the company is about, what kind of problems they work on, how their culture is, what they have to offer. They might not directly write the number, but they do express if they pay competitively, if they pay marginally, if they pay equally, right? Or if they're open to negotiation, every small word that they have written, phrase that they have written maps to something that is relevant to your job, right? People don't write JDs that do not have important information, right? If a JD is two page long, it means they are that much clearer of whom they want to hire, right? So the longer the JD, the you can expect that the clearer the company is. And generally, that has been my uh, observation. Great teams, great companies write very nice JDs, right? We'll see individual parts of JD as well. I'm just speaking overall for now. What you have to do post reading the JD end to end is you can go over LinkedIn, look at the company, look at the number of employees, look at what they have written about themselves, which domain they belong to, right? You might not know every company by name. Right. So you have to do this level zero of homework, level zero of research. This is just to see whether you find them compatible or not, the kind of company you want to work with, right? What kind of projects they have worked on? What did they build? What apps they have produced? What is their audience? What is the scale of their users? How many clients are they? Are they B2B, B2C, B2B2B, or B2B2C, sorry, right? There are different ways everything that you can learn. How is their website? Is it pleasing? Is it boring? Are they, are they interesting? Are they artistic? Everything matters, right? Every small and big thing that you pick up from the JD matters, right? And then when you learn about the company, it matters. So this is just to see whether you want to apply for the job or not. We are still in the before applying stage, right? I'm yet to apply. I want to get more clarity, right? That's, that's human psychology then see who's the hiring manager and his team. Many people do this, right? Sorry. Many people do this. They see who the hiring manager is. Sometimes they write the HR who's hiring, right? So you can go to their profile, see the people in that company and see who are the hiring managers or who are the data science managers. And you're probably working with one of them, right? So you can get a fair estimate. You can also see the rest of the team, what level of data scientists are present. You can just visit their LinkedIn profiles and see how experienced they are, overall how great the team is, right? Because that's eventually uh, your family with, with whom you want to work, right? You really want them to be excelled in their careers for you to excel in yours. Spend time understanding the current work and the upcoming work that the company is trying to solve, right? Straightforward. This is again a very strong recommendation, which again, I know majority of you guys or even candidates do not do, is they do not read what the company has written across medium or their tech blogs on their website about their culture, everything, right? So they write out for a reason because if something does not interest you or puts you off, they wouldn't want to waste your time or their time, right? And if the things attract you, then you are double excited to interview for the job now, right? So it's a win-win in both the situations. Either you save time as a company or you get a great candidate, right? So do read their blogs. You don't have to read every character that they have written. Just skim through the blogs, skim through the medium articles. If higher functioning authorities like directors of engineering, directors of data science, VPs, CFO, CXOs have written articles, I mean, it shows what kind of a culture they follow. They also try to explain more about their company, right? I've done this a lot where I try to understand a company by reading these articles. And then only if I feel that, okay, they are working on something exciting, they're working on something relevant, then I make sure I apply to the company, right? Visiting LinkedIn is a great way of reflecting you're researching for the company and that you're interested. You have built a rapport even before the interview has started. That's correct, right? Yes. These are smaller things. These are easier things, right? So we should be good at it with practice. And what do you do while applying? Right? So the three stages, one is before, one is while, and one is after applying. So what do you do while applying? Hey, Frank, welcome. I'm just seeing you uh, for the first time. So yeah, hope you are on, on board with uh, the presentation. Yeah. Okay, while applying, ensure you strictly match the education minimum years of experience, right? This is a strict criteria, guys, right? Don't think that somebody on the other hand, on the other side is lenient that if you're two years experienced and they're looking for five years experience, they'll be okay with it. They will not be okay with it, right? 
the HR will manually filter out your resume, right? So if you have applied for 100 jobs out of which 90, you don't even qualify for these two criteria, right? Let's say they expect a minimum PhD, right? And a minimum of five years of experience, right? If out of 100 jobs, if I see that 90 jobs that you have applied, you don't match these criteria, then they don't even matter. In reality, you have only applied for 10 jobs, right? So don't compare the number of jobs you have applied, compare it with the number of correct jobs that you have applied or the compatible jobs that you have applied to, right? These are very strict criteria, guys, for hiring managers, right? They do not budge or negotiate on it. Startups do, but even they don't do more than a year. If you have four years experience and they're, they're looking for somebody five years experience, they are just, they compromise there, but they ensure that your four years experience is in the domain, is intersecting with the kinds of problems that they're working on or the tech that they're working on. A lot of things matter there, right? That's just an exception. The second thing, ensure that you possess at least 80% of the listed skills in the JD, right? Again, if this is not the case, it is very, very unlikely that your resume will get filtered in, right? Why do you need 80% of the listed skills? Let me give you a situation. So now either you could be a fresher or you could be an experienced candidate. I'll talk about experienced candidate because they will have more listed skills. For fresher, generally the expectations of skill set is less. If a senior candidate possesses, let's say 60% of the expected skills, six out of 10 skills, right? It will take him time to learn the remaining four skills. Plus it will take him time to onboard and pick up a project and deliver for which his expectations might be immediate because he's already interviewing for a senior role, right? The more senior you go, the expectations of your deliveries are shorter. The more immediate the deliveries are expected, the more immediate they expect you to be thorough with the, for you to be comfortable with the working ways of the company, the tech stack, because we're talking technical interviews, the tech stack, the projects, the products, right? With their interactions with various teams, everything expect to be shortened the higher you go in your career. So if you do not match a minimum number of listed skills, it is very difficult that they would give you a chance to interview with them, right? You might be having six out of 10 skills and you might be really great at all those six out of 10, right? If they feel that the, there is a minimum cut of 80% of the listed skills in your resume and what they're expecting, your again, your resume will not be counted. Right? So this is to ensure while you're applying. Yeah, talking about core data science jobs, ensure that the listed skills are related to data science. A lot of uh, not so great companies who hire data scientists for the title of them, but eventually they end up doing data analyst work or data cleaning work or web scraping work. That's not really data science role, right? So the listed skills have to apply to data science. That's a must. That is a filtering criteria for you to throw out a company that you want to apply to. Right. If a company is expecting you to know everything, again, it's a bad sign, right? given the number of years of experience. If you're applying for, let's say, a director of engineering kind of position, then you will have a lot of breadth skills because you're at least 12 years experience. If you're applying to, let's say, zero to two years experienced data science roles, like most of you guys fit the person off, then the listed skills should be less and they should be towards data science. You can have a few more around it, like database management systems or object-oriented product programming or operating systems and all. That all is fine. That's still computer science related, right? But you cannot have things like, I don't know, AWS, Azure, or the other things, right? Listed as data science skill set. Highlight your resume with projects related to the company. This I've already stated. Write a personal recommendation why you're best for the job. So most jobs on LinkedIn also come with an optional text box that they let you to write even on other platforms uh, where they let you express why they should interview with you or why they should hire with you. Again, this is like your opportunity to tell them why you're better than the other candidates. Right? So this is self-explanatory. After applying, yeah, follow periodically uh, with the people uh, who are in charge of the job right if a company's name is listed on linkedin while applying for a job you can go and follow up with the hr who's hiring for that particular department or you can just write to any hr and say okay i applied for a data science job whom can i connect to see my feedback or response right following up gives a sense of uh, ownership for the interviewer or the hiring committee and the hr being professional will forward that 
to the hiring manager that this candidate has followed up with me when I was inactive on his profile. So it creates a positive impression overall. Okay. So let's see what are the things you need to do when you are applying to data science and when you are present in a data science interview, when you're applying to data science jobs, right? When you actually get your resume filtered through and you have an interview scheduled. And this is a few things that might help you to keep an overall uh, good impression or a green flag in your interview, right? First of all, yeah, by the criteria we already spoke, understand the companies that you should selectively apply to and the roles in those companies, right? And only apply to them. Don't apply to every job that comes in front of you. Like I expressed, do your homework on the company, projects, clients, products, user base, etc. Be prepared with a couple of questions for each round of interview. Right? This is much, this increases chances of you moving to the next round because they feel that you're interested and curious about the company. These questions could be related to the company, could it to be related to the role, it could be related to tech, it could be related to how they are solving a particular problem. They could be very generic to very specific, right? Understand what kind of interview you are in. Is it an HR interview? Is it a tech interview? Is it a hiring manager interview? Is it a leadership role interview, right? And ask those kinds of questions, right? Let's say if it's a leadership role interview, then I would ask like, how do you visualize me to play this role effectively? Right. So that's an example. Again, read the company blogs and articles. Now, this is once you are in uh, in for an interview, right? You might want to read some blogs that they have written, tech blogs, to understand their work, right? And then probably you can point it out that I've read this in this blog that you have solved this problem this way. Probably adding some value to it, you can give them some helpful thoughts that you think might help them improve that project, right? Look for a great manager. This is like. If I have to put one point in front of every other point, I would just put this. If your manager is great, there's a very, very high chance that your career will move forward very fastly. Right? So having a great manager is the best perk of a job period. No matter what is the salary, no matter whether you're working online or offline, all things kept aside. If you have a great manager, technically, managerially, it's, it's just the best part. Tailor your resume to showcase relevant projects and skills. Yeah. So that your discussion is on relevant subjects around their company as well as around your project. And this is something you need to be honest about that you have to be genuinely interested in the company, be genuinely interested in working as a data scientist, that you have to have that passion and that motive, that inspiration to solve problems in data science or solve problems for the company that you're interviewing with. Have a good grasp of breadth-wise skills, like I was saying, right? To solve a machine learning problem, you cannot just be good at modeling MLs, ML codes, right? You cannot just be good at doing machine learning models. You have to be an end-to-end -end engineer where you can download or scrape the data from various websites. You can clean the data, which is data engineering. You can visualize the data probably for removing outliers or whatever tasks you need. It could even be for presenting it to other people, right? non-tech people in your company, you obviously have to read and write from databases because all data is stored in databases. Nothing is ever stored in CSV files. And you have to be able to do obviously ML modeling and write an API around it so you can show it out or host it as a web app To It could be the interviewing committee and they can put a link in your resume to that or it could be just on your GitHub where you create a demo and just put it as a web app through it. Yes, this I've also said, okay, be thorough with math theory and implementation of the projects that you've written in your resume for the algorithms. Okay, Akash has a question. I'm learning data science on an online platform. Three months ago, I completed college, but I cannot finish my degree because of financial conditions. I'm curious in data science, can I get a job? Yeah, it's a very uh, higher level question, Akash. Right? It, the first thing that I think about when you ask this question is where do you learn data science from, right? Are you, how is the quality of education and what kind of projects you have done, right? Those are the questions that come in my mind immediately, right? As an interviewer, if these three things take off well, if you have learned it from a trusted party, like I was saying, you can't just write Coursera on your resume and expect to get a job. 90% of the people out there are doing Coursera. The I don't have a problem with that. My only thing is it doesn't help you stand out. 
if you're doing it from Coursera, for example, you should also supplement it with industry projects and not just Coursera assignments. That is something that I would supplement. Although Coursera assignments will provide you a minimum ground to understand and implement these projects, but you will be on the same level as every other candidate who has done that course, right? And almost lakhs of people have done that course, right? So you will not stand out in an interview or your resume will not stand out in front of an HR. It all again come back, comes back to, now that you've learned from this entity, what did you implement? Right? Because people want to see what you've implemented on. So it all boils down to the kind of projects that you have done and how you have implemented these projects, how good are you at it, right? Are you guys able to relate to it? Are you guys able to identify your gaps in probably resume or JDs or interviews? Did you learn something new? Yeah, that you might have been doing wrongly that you can correct now, right? What kind of projects do you recommend for a fresher? Yeah, I mean, uh, as a fresher, again, instead of telling you what kind of projects to work on, I can tell you what a project, what kind of projects actually matter in an interview, okay? The kind of projects that matter in an interview are close to ones which are worked on real data sets. Let's say Infosys hosted a problem a couple of years ago where they wanted to identify, given a car image, they wanted to identify the number plate in that image. Basically, what are the number on the number plate, right? You can do this project in two ways. Either you can solve this problem for Infosys on Kegel, picking up their data set, which is a real world data set of parking lots of people, of cars entering and leaving uh, probably malls and public places, right? That they've authorized access to, obviously. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is making it a college project where you download a data set from a small website that has, let's say, 500 images and do the same problem, right? Which one do you think, Abhinav, you know, holds more value and holds more learnings for you? Is it the Infosys one or is it a 500 records college assignment, right? I'll leave you to understand that. Srikant asks, any website or YouTube channel that we should refer to to ACE data science interview, right? Yeah, great question. Uh, we're about to jump into that, answering that question. That's right up enough, right? We would definitely want to work something which is more close to real world, right? Because that will have valuable learnings and that's something you can write on your resume, right? Yeah, so those are the kind of projects that I would recommend to a fresher to see more more value in, in the project and how close they are to real world, right? I see a lot of, uh, oh yeah, I can definitely show you a sample resume, right? Just give me a moment, let me show you my resume itself. Let me know if my screen is visible, guys, my resume is visible. Yes, okay, thanks, Mayank. So uh, I'm going to hide my personal information. Yeah, thank you. So see, this is the open text that I was talking to you about. If you guys can give it a minute to read or I'll read it out for you. I'm product oriented data scientist, like to develop software in its entirety. Research, implementing papers, building models, deployment, DB, backend design, right? I love writing multi-processing code. I've deployed one Android app and two web apps, right? So see, this speaks about me the way I want it to. Okay? This speaks about me breadth-wise, as well as showing the real industry value and in the kind of apps I've productionized, right? Right now it is two Android apps and two web apps, by the way, right? I need to update it. So it's, it's, this is my field. I can talk about myself. I can express myself without limitations, right? Then again, if I talk about skill set, as you can see, my skills are listed categorically. Sorry for that. See, my skills are listed category, categorically. Right, I need to reduce this size. See, all my programming languages, databases, operating systems, the open source libraries, web frameworks, knowledge bases, everything I've used is very categorical, right? Everything I'm familiar with. Then my work experience comes, I've, I've used fonts, different kinds of fonts, probably bolds to express the company names, and then uh, italics to express the research papers I've implemented and read, and then individual items which are listed as the name of the project. And then there is a two line or three line explanation of the project, as you can see, right? Yeah, so uh, that's about me. And that's a sample resume, right? Uh, I do not mind sharing it with all of you. Actually, you can uh, use it as a reference. Before I stop sharing my resume, do you guys have any questions? Uh, Srikant asks, how important is Tableau or Power BI for data science? I would say zero out of 10, Srikant. 
that is a data analyst skill, not a data scientist skill. I have never learned or used Tableau or Power BI in eight years, and nobody has ever asked me to. Or the saddest thing that I feel for a lot of people around is they don't really understand what data science is and what you need to be master at to master data science and to work as a real data scientist. Right. And a lot of people out there leverage it out and make you feel artificially that you're a data scientist, but they don't teach you the real concepts. And that's where Aptute stands out. We are honest to what we do. And when we say data science, we just teach data science and we play students in data science. If I have no experience, then how can I make a resume, right? So basically, you're, that's what you're talking about, right, Anike? Uh, as a fresher, how can I uh, make my resume, right? So one of the things that if I'm a fresher, how can I create my resume, right? So now if you're a fresher, you your resume might look a little smaller, right? It might have less projects, but you can do a lot more because you're fresher. You do not have to spend eight to 12 hours working for a company. So you can build that, spend that time building your skills, building your real skill set, adding projects to your resume. So probably if I have to create a project now, I have to put 12 hours aside for my company. And then in the 12 hours that are left in my day, I have to spend probably two to three hours on a project. Right. But for you, your whole day is yours. And you can probably do a lot of projects deeper and faster by investing more time, right? So work on more projects that interest you, not just for the number of projects that you've worked on, but to build the portfolio that I was talking about. I want to switch from testing to data science. What is the best way to switch from experience one and a half years, says Srikant. Right, great question. Okay, let me answer all these group of questions in one shot. Take care. Okay, Akash says, I'm not great at DSA, but I'm good at data science modules i can't solve dsa problems yes okay i'll answer this question as well uh, in the coming topic now cool great again very relevant to the topic that i'm about to jump at All right thank you guys for making the case for it okay aniket says uh, i have confusion between data scientist versus data analyst versus data engineer okay i would assume this is a question for the majority and i'll answer it before i jump in the next topic, I'll go reverse. What's a data engineer versus data analyst versus data scientist? A data engineer is somebody who does, let me get the slide back. Yes. So as you see here, right, scraping data, comma data engineering. This is the order in which you do these things, guys, actually. If you have not observed, you first scrape data, then you engineer the data, then you visualize the data, then you put it in a database, then you do your ML modeling, obviously, and you write APIs around your data, right, or your models. Right. So this is actually the order you follow when you create a project. Now, what is a data engineering or core skill or what does a data engineer do at its core, right? They are very respected positions, guys. Do not underestimate them. They do a lot of scraping and cleaning up of data, right? Companies like Facebook, companies like Instagram, Snap, LinkedIn, they get terabytes of data every day. Right, storing, managing, accessing, cleaning this data is not a piece of joke. Right, they scrape a lot of data, they gather a lot of data, they engineer, which is they clean a lot of data, and they place it in various databases, not just SQL or Mongo. It could be Elasticsearch, it could be other uh, distributed search engines that use these databases on top of it. Right, so that's data engineering. That has to do a lot with manipulating data, scrape, downloading data, creating indices for data, databases for data, storing data, cleaning data, right? What does a data analyst do compared to it? Once the data is cleaned and stored in a database, a data analyst uses these tools like Tableau, Power BI, Altrix. These are data visualization tools, right? That help you analyze the data using a UI, which, are, which is a tool basically using a tool. You don't write a lot of code as a data analyst, right? What you end up doing is you take these data sets import these data sets either from databases or static files into these tools, apply through click of buttons, apply any ML algorithm on it and get the design and get whatever the result comes out, right? So the only thing that you cannot do here is you cannot create models as data analyst, right? You can just see what the, whatever the algorithm is, however it is working. You cannot tune the algorithm. You cannot tweak your data set. You, because you're not coding here, you can just use the individual components together and 
be satisfied with whatever you get right you can visualize data in various ways using these tools again that also is a part of data analyst job but what a data scientist does i think most of you knows is he or she creates actual machine learning models he takes data from this data engineering output models the data feature engineers the data normalizes it transitions the data transforms the data into the ways he wants and then applies actual ml models builds machine learning models on top of it deep learning models on top of it to achieve the task that is in front of him so that's what a data scientist does is it clear for everyone the difference between data engineer versus data analyst versus data scientist see as i said the, the nucleus of building a great resume is building great projects the nucleus of answering questions in an interview is understanding the concepts at its core right theoretically mathematically and practically the way to express all that in an interview is to be able to understand them well before an interview right and then rest is obviously hard work and luck cool awesome okay great questions great interactions